Now on to Geoffrey Smith goes under glass and shows how to run a greenhouse to the maximum effect the whole year round. To run any garden economically, but even more important, to get the maximum pleasure out of it, you really do need a greenhouse. At least I do, because, if possible, I want to raise all my plants from seed or from cutting. And to do that, I need a greenhouse. It's impossible otherwise. Greenhouses really do come in all shapes and sizes, so no matter how peculiar your garden in shape, you can get a greenhouse to fit it. You can get them made in wood, you can get them made in aluminium. And I happen to garden in a very, very exposed place. I'm not exaggerating this, because the wind comes down the dale sometimes, and it blows anything that isn't very firmly anchored over. So an aluminium house, 8 feet by 12 feet, is just about all I can manage. I could do with one three times as big. I've never met a gardener yet whose greenhouse was big enough because you'll find once you've got it, you can fill it and you can use it all the year round. Now, during the winter, I find it much too expensive to heat the greenhouse. I do all my seed raising of tender things indoors in the house. But during the winter, I've got it full of things like primroses and gold laced polyanthus and hardy rhododendrons, all things that are quite happy with no heat, but with the little protection they get from a cold greenhouse, they flower right through the winter. Early bulbs in a cold greenhouse, little daffodils and iris and that type of thing, and crocus, full open on a warm winter's day. As good a reason as any that I can think of for having a greenhouse, I can garden in the winter as well as the summer. But really, it's in March that it comes into its own. I realize how useful it is, because it's March when I start the main bulk of the seed sowing. With vegetables and with bedding out plants and with perennials, there seems to be so much work to do that you wonder just how you're going to get through it. But you always do. And one thing I would suggest to anyone who's building a greenhouse for the first time and working in it, don't make the whole mass of your seed sowing in one weekend because they all come ready for pricking out at the same time. That's the business of moving the seedlings out of the seed pan into a bigger container. And for the average garden, you don't need a bigger pot than that. You get quite enough seed in there to suffice for the average garden needs. It's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, of compost and space and everything else to sow a whole seed tray of Brussels sprouts when you only need, what, 20 plants at the very most. So, use a standard pot for the, what I call a routine seed sowing of vegetables and of, of bedding out plants, and a standard compost, because if you're messing about with a different compost for this and a different pot for that, then you're going to get your watering all mixed up. It's very easy to get a peat-based compost in a plastic pot over wet. And enough water to keep that over wet we'll leave a clay pot with a, an ordinary loam-based compost too dry. So, I stick to a standard mix, and then when I've got to leave the greenhouse for any length of time, I know just how much water to give the pot to keep it just right until I get back. And then, using a pot press, very lightly firm it down. That's important with peat-based compost, not to over-firm. Very important, too, to get it level. Now, 
I know it doesn't matter with a big seed like a Brussels sprout or a cabbage, but with lobelia or, or a very fine seed like that, if the surface of your compost is like a piece of corrugated paper, all the seed washes down into the grooves, and then when you cover them, they're buried too deep. A Brussels sprout, in the big seed, you can almost count them out. Now, I know you can sow Brussels sprouts out into the open garden, no problem. But with overwintering vegetables like Brussels sprouts, like savoy cabbages, like leeks, I like to give them as long a growing season as possible. Space them out like that. You can almost pick them out individually and put them round the surface of the compost like that. And then, if you haven't a lot of time for pricking out, they can stay in the pot for Ooh, a week, fortnight longer than they normally would have done if you'd scattered them over the top of the compost. So it'll be quite enough there, nicely spaced. And cover them. Again, the depth isn't so critical with big seeds. Turn them lightly in and then label it, because all brassicas, all cabbages look alike in a seed pan. And if you don't have a label in there, you won't know whether the Brussels sprouts or cauliflowers or what have you. I don't need to water that because I make sure always with peat-based compost that it's moist enough, at least for the first two or three very important early days. And then, just to conserve all the heat possible, Cover it with a sheet of glass. And then newspaper. Newspaper is a, a marvelous insulating material. And I find that most vegetable seeds germinate, what, 50, 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's not difficult to maintain, even in an unheated greenhouse, provided you take precautions. I made certain the compost was wet enough before I sowed the seed, no more watering but check that every day, and as soon as the seeds have germinated, lift them out into the light. They must have light as soon as they germinate. Once the seeds have germinated, they begin to get overcrowded and you've got to prick them off. That's the business of lifting them out of the seed pan and spacing them out in a seed tray. In other words, giving them room to grow on to the size that they need to be before they go out in the garden. And you can see how overcrowded they're getting in the container there. They begin to fight each other for light and for air, and they're going to get weakened if I don't move them on. And these are tagetes, but exactly the same principle applies whether you're growing pansies, whether you're growing tomatoes, whether you're growing cabbage, or whether you're growing French marigolds. You mustn't ever let them get overcrowded. And I happen to like tagetes. So I grow big trays of them. You can scatter them anywhere in the garden, use them to fill holes down between the shrubs. And that's what I use most of the half-hardy annuals for. And it's a good idea to prick them out while the tops are still small enough. If you look at that seedling there, there's the root. Now, if I let that get any bigger, when I make a hole like that, it's a, a bad enough job getting the roots into that at that stage. You imagine if the root was any bigger, how difficult it would be. So prick them out at the first true leaf stage. And what was good enough for the seedlings in the seed compost is good enough to prick them out into. You don't want a too rich compost for half-hardy annuals because you're going to stimulate growth. You're going to get a soft sappy growth that isn't good at all and the more root system and the more powerful framework you build up at this stage the better plant you're going to get to flower in the summer and i space them out like that over the container i give them about a fortnight in the greenhouse and then i put them out into the frame to gradually harden them off so they're ready for going out into the garden Ooh, late may early june there's one thing for certain. If I need a greenhouse for vegetables, my goodness, I need it doubly so.
for the bedding plants because they are tender. They mustn't in any way be frosted, exposed even to low temperatures, otherwise they die off. And don't forget when the tray is full to water the plants in and that just finishes the job off nicely. And this is when the greenhouse really begins to pay for itself, when all the bedding plants that I sowed in the spring are in flower. The adjuratum and the begonias and the tagetae, giving me a different colour theme exactly where I want it. And look at the begonias with the light coming through from behind them. It changes the colour entirely. And then the pus face on the pansies. Look at flowers as individuals, not as a collective whole. But the great beauty is that I don't have to take what the garden centres have on offer. I can choose my plants and grow exactly what will fit into the character of the garden. One of the most important vegetable crops I grow are runner beans. But the problem is when you're gardening in a very cold, exposed place, to get them started early enough, because to have the full potential of crop, you've got to have them into flower what? By the end of June, which means I start them into growth in the greenhouse. About the middle of April, I'm aiming at slow, balanced growth. I want a good, steady growth. Nothing soft or luxuriant, because as soon as the weather is a little bit milder, say, ooh, second week in May, they go out into the frame. And I get a peat pot like that. And I sow two seeds in a pot, not because I'm eternally pessimistic, I'm always apprehensive with runner beans that both won't germinate. If I've only got one seed in a pot, then I'm stuck with an empty pot. If I put two seed in, and let's face it, there's always more seed in a packet than you really need, I pull one out if both germinate and just leave one to a pot. And then, because in a garden like mine, you can never be certain that the first week in June is going to be right for putting them out. So I take a precaution that if I've got to wait another week or even a fortnight, then they're not going to check through starvation. You know, one of the strange things i found with all plants, it doesn't matter what they are, if they become unhappy at any stage in the growth, then that plant is weakened and it takes them that much longer to get over it. So I take a seed tray like that. Instead of putting the pot direct onto the bare bottom of the seed tray, I put a layer of compost in and stand the pot on that. And that serves a dual purpose. If they've got to be held in the pots that little bit longer, then they can root through the bottom of the peat pot into the compost underneath and get that little extra nutriment that stops them starving to death. And the other thing, in the rush and, and bustle of planting out and bedding out and watering is one of the things that gets skimmed. Not on purpose. You think, oh, the surface of the compost is wet, then the whole pot is wet. It isn't, you know. Quite often with these, the surface is wet, very wet, but the base of the pot is dry. And when you stand them on compost like that, they can take the moisture from the compost. It keeps them evenly moist right through. Vitally important.
I really would find it very difficult to run my garden without a greenhouse. So many of the plants that I grow, both in the flower and vegetable garden, start their life here, because in a greenhouse I can steal a march on the weather. Tomatoes are one crop that I make no attempt to grow outside in this garden now. They're so delicate and unpredictable as far as I'm concerned. But I start them indoors, I keep them indoors, I ripen them indoors. The only time, really, they go outdoors is when I'm crossing between the greenhouse and the house with a plate full of ripe tomatoes in my hand. Now, tomatoes are unpredictable. I don't take any chances. The compost I use is a peat-based compost. It's sterile. I'm putting them into peat pots so that once the roots are through the bottom, I can plant them out. And I'm going to keep them in the best temperature I can provide to keep them in balanced, sustained growth. Put them into to a hole, about ooh, half an inch, quarter of an inch deep. And then if both germinate, I pull one of them out. But all the time I'm conscious that a tomato's main requirements are for a warm, equable temperature. You don't want fluctuations up and down. You want a warm, equable temperature. No drafts, no sudden shocks or chills. Nothing that's going to discommode them in any way. I am almost fussy to the point of being over careful with tomatoes. The layer of compost in the bottom of a seed tray, very important, particularly with these, because I'm aiming at a humid, moist atmosphere for germination anyway. Something like a monsoon jungle would have accurately describe it. Now I'm going to water those well, put them in the airing cupboard. And though the airing cupboard's dark, I cover them with newspaper because that tends to control, to create again a microclimate effect. Moist, humid, an equable temperature, well, around about 60, 65. Within five days, they'll germinate, and as soon as they're up, I'll bring them down into the light, onto the kitchen windowsill. And this is my early crop. These have had the same treatment as my tomatoes get every year. Germinate in the airing cupboard, then onto the kitchen windowsill, and there, you see, it doesn't matter what the weather conditions are. Now, admittedly, Light intensity in the winter when I saw these was fairly low. So growth isn't as sturdy and strong as it'll be with my later sowings. But they're healthy enough. Now I'm going to get an early pick of tomatoes without wasting any extra money on heat. Ooh, the smell. You can smell the tomato fragrance. And there, the roots are through the base of the pot. Important when you're growing anything in a peat pot, let the roots get through the base. Otherwise, they stay inside. Now, that is almost, almost ready for going into growing bags. Now, these, these will go into the kitchen sink for a thoroughly good warm covering of newspaper, then at the airing cover to germinate. And once your bedding plants are out of the greenhouse, you want to have your tomatoes ready to come in because with only one greenhouse, I can't afford to have it empty for any length of time at all. And your tomatoes want to be at this stage. They must be showing a flower truss before you put them into the grow bags. If you put them into the grow bags before they're showing that flower truss, which means they've got the flowering habit, then all they're going to do is grow. You're putting them into a very good rooting medium. You are encouraging vegetative growth at the expense of fruit production. But there, they're just about right. And I know you're supposed to put three tomatoes into one of these standard-sized growing bags, but I reckon if you treat them right, the two's as much as it'll take. At least that's the way I grow them, because you get an overcrowded condition in the greenhouse, and you tend to get all sorts of leaf troubles with the tomato, so I make two. And growing conditions are ideal in there, at least they will be when I put some water in. 
I've never found that watering the grow bag before you put the plant in makes much difference. In fact, all I find is it makes a mess. So I put them in, and then I give it a really good soaking. It's important that you make certain the whole of the rooting medium is thoroughly moist, and then you maintain it like that because the prime cause of blossom end rot, that's that little hard piece at the end of the fruit, is letting the plants get dry at the root at some stage in the development. And just as it's important not to overcrowd the plants in the growing bag, it's equally important to make certain they're ventilated properly. It is really a mistake to keep the ventilators tight closed all the time. And when you're ventilating, you naturally open on the leeward side so the wind isn't blowing straight in and onto the plants themselves because they have tender foliage. And one of the problems I've had in the past is caning the plants to support them and then finding when the whole weight of the crops come onto the stakes that they've collapsed on the greenhouse floor and kinked the stem. And that way I've lost pounds of fruit. So this time, I drilled the metalwork of the greenhouse and put an eyed bolt in and then stretched wire between the two, tightened it up, and now I can tie the canes to that. If I get a crop of tomatoes that break that wire, it won't worry me all, all at all because I'll be the proudest man in Yorkshire. Always tie plant to stake and not stake to plant. Make sure it's firmly round the cane. And there you've got the support capable of expanding to accommodate the stem, and yet it's still firmly secured to the cane. And notice the side shoot there. Much the best way to take them out when they're young like that. And remember, as the flower truss opens, the best time to pollinate, I use a little camel hair brush soft. When the flowers are full open at midday, when the sun is bright on them, that means the pollen's running. And you just go along and you touch the flowers individually and you gather the pollen on the soft brush and transfer it from one flower to another. You can make a noise like a bumblebee if you like while you do it. But that is vitally important. As soon as you've done that, you damp the floor of the greenhouse down to create a moist atmosphere because a pollen grain is like any other seed. It's got to germinate, it's got to grow down the style and fertilize the ovaries. And then you get the swelling fruit. And once that fruit starts to swell, you start feeding. And then comes the moment when you pick the first ripe tomato. And all the work's worthwhile. Absolutely worthwhile. Lights of gardening. Gardener's proper reward for effort. Fresh picked tomatoes. They don't need anything else but the warmth of the sun in them. A bouquet of summer. Delectable. And the beauty of it is, there's plenty more to come. <laughs> 